Hello and welcome to Views on News. I am Jawad Hami. Now, several international organizations have been raising alarm and concern regarding as to what the Indian authorities' atrocities and gross human rights violations had been continuing in the Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. These international organizations had been trying to draw the international communities, especially the major world powers, attention towards India's gross human rights violations in the occupied valley. Uh, however, despite these repeated calls by the international organizations, there hasn't been any halt to the brutalities uh, on the part of Indian authorities, including the Indian government, as well as Indian troops in IIOJK with the international community, especially the major powers, largely um, staying as a silent spectator. Now, these atrocities had been continuing since the partition of Indian subcontinent in 1947. However, uh, there has been uh, an increase manifold to these atrocities and gross human rights violations since Indian illegal and unilateral action of 5th of August 2019 when it revoked the article 370 that actually gave autonomy and a special status to Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Now, there is a long list of India's violation of international law as regard to the situation in Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, later on, uh, most recently we have seen adding insult to injury. The Indian Supreme Court has upheld that unilateral and illegal action of Indian government uh, of revoking Article 370 back on 5th of August in 20. In 19. Now, this particular biased uh, verdict by India's top court uh, was, of course, condemned by Pakistan as well as from across the political spectrum in Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. There are numerous United Nations Security Council resolutions uh, which urge India to let the Kashmiris exercise their inalienable right to self-determination through free, fair and impartial plebiscite under the UN supervision. But Indian authorities have been blatantly uh, violating all those United Nations Security Council uh, resolutions. Now, uh, in a, re a recent major incident, three innocent Kashmiris have been tortured to death in Indian troops' custody in Poonch. And a purported video of this inhumane treatment also got circulated on the social media after which Indian authorities suspended the mobile and internet services ever uh, since Pakistan's foreign office has strongly condemned the killings, saying the incident once again exposes India's relentless state terrorism in IIOJK. Now, there are certain reports that suggest that Indian Army has launched an investigation into this particular incident. Now, the question arises whether there is going to be any sort of an honest investigation into this particular incident and whether the perpetrators are going to be brought to book and held accountable or this particular investigation is going to be biased and washed up on the lines very similar to the biased verdict that was given by uh, Indian Apex Court regarding the Kashmir's status. Also, since the revocation of Article 370 on 5th of August in 2019, Indian authorities have been claiming uh, normalcy uh, in IIOJK. However, the statistics uh, which have been shared by Kashmir Media Service speak something very opposite and otherwise. Since 5th of August till 30th of November 2023, there have been 835 killings, 2,375 have been tortured or critically injured, 22,002 civilians have been arrested, 1,113 structures have been either arsoned or destroyed. Also, 60 women have been widowed, 116 children have been orphaned, and 100 and 29 women have been molested or gang raped. These statistics are from uh, that particular date when India went on to take that illegal and unilateral action in contravention to all the 
uh, United Nations Security Council resolutions regarding this internationally uh, recognized disputed territory. Uh, we'll be talking about as to what state of affairs are there in IIOJK, Indian authorities high handedness, its uh, continuous and blatant violation of international law and the relevant United Nations Security Council uh, resolutions. To discuss all that, we are honored to have been joined in the studio by Mr. Sirfraz Ahmed Rana, foreign policy expert. Mr. Rana, thank you very much for taking time out for views on news tonight. Really appreciate that. Let uh, me begin with uh, this particular uh, recent incident in Poonch, where three innocent Kashmiris being tortured to death in uh, the custody of Indian troops. And the kind of video that uh, we've seen, uh, they've been thrown and then uh, the chili powder is being used to uh, uh, put on their wounds. What sort of a mindset is that? Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Jawad, for having me in your, in your program. Uh, you know, as uh, you have described uh, many things in many dimension in your uh, very comprehensive introduction, and uh, one of the important things which you mentioned about the behavior and attitudes of great powers. I mean, the great powers which preach liberal values, human rights, and rule of law, and you know, all those uh, very soft uh, uh, side and also the compliance of international law. So whatever India has been doing so far, uh, India has a confidence and backing of the great powers. Why? Because they are putting just a blind eye on whatever happening in the Kashmir and especially in Indian occupied Kashmir. So India is doing, uh, you know, with as you mentioned in your introduction, with impunity. So they have uh, uh, a confidence and backing, backing of the, uh, the great powers, especially, you know, US and uh, European Union and all those uh, major powers, right? Which are basically dictating and setting the global political agenda and economic agenda. Number one. Number two, of course, you know, there is another important aspect to it, which is the economic, uh, so-called economic rise of India. Why? Because the global community, international community, is completely blindfolded by the, uh, by the economic indicators, our economic rise, and especially, you know, the attractive market of India. Uh, right? So th that's why, you know, they have not been openly talking about uh, the Indian mass uh, human rights violation in Indian occupied Kashmir, number two. Number three, there is another important thing that India is not just, uh, you know, violating uh, international law, which is uh, with reference to uh, Indian occupied Kashmir, but of course, you know, India has been involved in some surveillance uh, at, uh, they have created a network of uh, spies at international level. You're right, uh, we had seen uh, some developments in Canada. Why? Because there is now a deadlock between, diplomatic deadlock between ca Canadian government and Indian government. Number three, number four, of course, you know, US is not also happy and Biden refused to come to the Indian Republic Day. And, uh, you know, Biden is refusing to, it's one of the important vital uh, ally partner, strategic partner here in Asia Pacific region, right? So these, I mean, these are the important things, I mean, uh, which I mentioned. Uh, you know, that basically highlights that why the great powers are basically passive towards Indian behavior in Indian occupied Kashmir. Uh, right, uh, you already mentioned the backing of the great powers. That's why India is confidently doing whatever it deems is um, good for its own interests. Now, uh, specifically talking about the second point that you've just highlighted, the economic interests and so-called lucrative market India presents to the world, especially the major Western uh, powers. Are the economic interests at the cost of human dignity? and upholding the human rights? I mean, yes, I mean, absolutely yes. I mean, as far as your question is concerned, I mean, what is happening in Israel? India, uh, I mean, uh, India is basically, Prime Minister Modi is taking all the advice to deal the Kashmir issue with Netanyahu. And what is the credibility of Netanyahu at the moment, right? Netanyahu is being isolated by even their own uh, allies, like, you know, European Union and United States of America. I mean, 20,000, more than 20,000 people have been killed in Israel. So yes, I mean, Israel, who is protecting Israel? I mean, of course, the great powers, United States uh, has been vetoing constantly in the favor of Israel. So I mean, where, where is international law? Where, where are all those uh, liberal values which they preach, you know, to the weaker countries, for example, right? So of course, why not economic indicators? And uh, what is the place of uh, Israel in uh, Middle Eastern region, which is quite strate strategic region, uh, you know, uh, uh, for uh, for for U.S. Uh, for U.S. interest, strategic interest, oil interest, economic interest. So of course, I mean, economic interest at the expense of human rights violation. Yes. Okay. So the fourth, po uh, the third point that you already mentioned, that Biden's refusal to come and um, participate reportedly, reportedly, yes, so uh, far to participate in the republics, uh, India's Republic, Republic Day Day celebrations, right? On one side, uh, you're of the view that there are economic interests when it comes to the Western powers uh, as far as the kind of so-called lucrative market India pre presents to them. Uh, 
What does this particular refusal to participate in Republic Day celebrations in India actually depict? Is it only concerning to the American self-interest when there is a, an assassination plot that has been thwarted by their authorities over there well in time and they just give a blind eye to whatever is happening uh, in IIOJK or Israel for that matter? No, of course, you know, that, um, uh, that uh, the Biden's refusal basically came uh, just because, I mean, they, they just tried to do something or to harm the American citizen right here in the American soil. So that came just as a response to that specific uh, development in United States of America that India cannot violate so the sovereignty where, where of United States. we understand States. where the principle of equality when it comes to the implementation or upholding of human rights across the globe as per uh, the United Nations uh, Charter as well as a subsequent Universal Declaration of Human Rights is concerned. Uh, Jawad, to be equality. honest, to be honest, I mean, uh, there are no equalities in international relations. There are special kind of languages in international relations which are being used, right? And also, you know, application of international law is basically uh, is not equal. Application of international law, I mean, application of international law when it comes to weaker country, I mean, I mean, they will talk about high, they will talk high, right? When it comes to you know talking about the application of international law or human rights violation, uh, if there is Israel, if there is India, so there will uh, there, there, uh, there, uh, they will have the different approach, of course. Right. They will have the different approach. Uh, right. Your point is well taken. Mm -hmm. uh, we are honored to have been joined by another participant in the show, Dr. Farhan Naz, foreign affairs expert. Uh, Dr. Naz, thank you very much for taking time out for views on news tonight. We really appreciate that. Uh, let me begin uh, the discussion with you from this very recent incident of the custodial killing through torture uh, by the Indian troops of three innocent Kashmiris. And the kind of visuals we've seen related to that incident that actually garnered a huge anger on social media after there was a suspension by the Indian authorities of the mobile and internet services. What sort of mindset that depict when we specifically talking about uh, putting chili powder on the wounds of already tortured innocent people? Um, thank you very much, Javon, for having me on the show. Um, if you speak about that kind of cases and incidents, is that, that I think this is not the first time. There is a reputation of violation of human rights taking place when it comes to the people of Kashmir and uh, Kashmiris altogether. But the problem is, who to be blamed for and who we can hold accountable for such kind of atrocities because even in wartime such kind of uh, crimes never happen and if it happens by mistake then there are um, some punishments and humanitarian law to be held accountable for um, so, so in, in a case of Kashmiris there is no humanitarian, humanitarian law that we can call for there is no authority there is no international system there is no international law and there is no even national law which we can claim and, uh, and call for to bring uh, those, those people to justice. So this, there is this irony that is taking place in uh, this part of the world, unfortunately. And I would say is the, the whole uh, IOTA falls on the Indian government because uh, they are responsible for all such kind of atrocities to be stopped at one place. But is this at the behest of the, of the Bodhi government at first place? Because they are letting it happen. And if they are letting it happen, then why are they doing so? Is it an election? sort of stunt that they are taking place. If, if this is the case, probably this is a very bad one. So they are trying it at this time. And they should there should be stop at once and forever because humanitarian law should be prevailed. Come what may, if it's the national law or if it's the international law, it should be um, in letter and spirit followed the right way, which is unfortunately not followed in, in the Indian system, and particularly in the Kashmir. Right, uh, Dr. Naz, when we specifically about those provisions as per the international law, specifically taking into account the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as well as the International Covenant on uh, Civil and Political Rights, when specifically talk about the torture regarding these uh, particular instruments of the United Nations, what do they specifically uh, uh, say about it and how uh, those instruments actually address such issues of torture and custodial killings? Well, uh, with a very heavy heart, um, I would say is that I was in one of the uh, conferences where the head of the, the UN Human Rights Commission, they were also there. And um, I raised the question in the context of not only the people in Gaza who are getting affected, but also uh, the people in Kashmir as well, whose lives is really threatened. And I tried to be the voice for all those marginalized societies who are getting victimized one way or the other. Um, and uh, the answer that I received for that was really heartbreaking and heart-wrenching. And that was that when the head of the human rights uh, said 
that uh, the United Nations has been hijacked. And he said that whenever I demand uh, any such kind of, you know, violation to be to be brought to justice, uh, the, the the prominent members in the in the UN Security Council, um, they always call me that I'm asking something beyond the UN mandate. So um, it really take me to understand and to think about whether uh, we have reached to that stage where we can say that the United Nations have failed as an institution, or it has been weakened to such an extent that now it cannot sustain or bring a peace and justice in the world where it demands and uh, stands for the rights of uh, all those communities whose lives and rights have been violated. So if they cannot bring justice, if they cannot bring those violated, violators into some kind of uh, you know, um, uh, position where they can be penalized for their action, this means the United Nations has been weakened to the core. And probably um, this is not the first time that international organizations fail to offer justice or to bring um, the, 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 the ones who are in violation of those human rights or the, or the international system into justice because the League of Nations also failed back in time. And that was the time when the United Nations was uh, introduced into the international system. So this takes me to think more about the, whether we need to have a third international system which can bring mm-hmm. justice to such kind of problems or do we need to bring reforms into the United Nations where the United Nations and, and its humanitarian, humanitarian law and the International uh, Criminal Court, they can bring all those violators into justice as well, irrespective of which powerful country is siding with them or which state they belong to. So everyone should be dealt on the basis of human rights and human beings rather than which um, uh, state are you a part of. Right, uh, Dr. Nazir, I, I want your understanding and, of course, knowledge regarding as India's status when it comes to uh, the being the signatory or ratification of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights in particular. Uh, and also, in light of that, in that sort of scenario, if it has ratified and is a signatory to it, so what ideally happens to be the mechanism uh, under this particular covenant when it comes to uh, uh, the international major forums such as the European Parliament or uh, the uh, United States Congress, that if such egregious uh, gross human rights violations in contravention to that particular international covenant on civil and political rights is taking place, uh, what ideally happens to be the mechanism that should actually come into play? Uh, well, it's a very good question. Um, that what actually can happen at this point in time when there is a, a very serious and gross violation of human rights that has been taken place by the, by the Indian uh, authorities. So, um, if I look into the legal aspects, yes, this is wrong and they should be uh, bring to justice. But can we really do that? Because we can see what is happening in the world today where there is um, no such discrimination between who is right and who is wrong, where if you are sided with the powerful, you are on the right side. And if you are going against the power, no matter if there is an extreme violation of the human rights, you are still not questioned for that. So unfortunately, we have we are living in, in an era or in, in a world which is really not caring a lot about human rights and which like in, 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 an, in a phase of extremism, I would call it, that where human life does not matter at all, where power matters, where showcasing your power really matters in the international system and in the regional politics as well. Here in this part, if we are talking about India, so yes, uh, without any um, shame and without any... Um, um, what it's called, like, you know, fe- fearing about, I would say, yes, India is playing a very um, extreme role in, in bringing the Kashmiris into a very uh, disrespectful and uh, very uh, extreme position. And nobody is questioning that. You're talking about EU and all of that. Whatever is happening even in that part, nobody is caring about human rights. As I said, human beings, human life and human uh, fear and their, their torture, it does not matter. And all what matters is who is doing that. And if that, but the, the country or the, or, the, or the power who is in the good books of the international system, this is all what matters. So India is having an edge of being um, in, in protection of all those powerful countries who themselves are involved in human rights violation. So probably this is a wave of human rights violation that is taking place in the world. And this is what we are witnessing today. 
And I, I would like to say is probably there is, whenever there is a rise, there is a fall as well for all extreme X. So I can see that probably something is going to lead towards to stop this atrocities in times to come. And the international system has to either reform itself or go and adopt for or another institution probably will, will came up because we have seen the way the, the UN um, Secretary General has been uh, constantly talking about that the United Nations have failed and uh, they need to, to uh, you know, to protect all those people and irrespective of where they are, who they are and what caste and what country and citizenship they belong to, they need to protect them. So probably there is a realization within the international system as well. There is a realization within the international legal framework as well. But time will take actions against all those who are in violation. And I can see when it specific, specifically comes to India, um, the United States and all its powerful allies like UK, Australia, and uh, Canada, they have all they have started you know, showing India its uh, position as well, that if you try to play very big, this is how we can cut you to the side. Because they will always like to have India on their side, but they know when and where to, to show India which position they can hold in the system when it comes to them as well. So I know uh -huh. where and how they're going to deal with it, but time will decide. Uh, right, uh, Dr. Farnaz, foreign affairs expert, thank you very much for being with us on Views on News tonight. Really appreciate that. We are honored to have been joined by another participant on the phone line, Dr. Asma Shakir Khaja, Executive Director of the Center of International Strategic Studies, Azad Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, Dr. Khaja, thank you very much for your time for being with us on Views on News tonight. Really appreciate that. Now, this particular incident of the custodial killings at the hands of Indian troops, of three innocent Kashmiris, uh, what is uh, the uh, international law as far as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights or Universal Declaration of Human Rights is concerned? And what ideally should be the mechanism uh, if uh, the perpetrators of such egregious acts are uh, to be brought to book and uh, to be held accountable? The law is relevant if Indian occupiers are forces of course, colonial power in India allows international law to flourish and implement it in occupied city of Jammu and Kashmir. India, uh, here it is pertinent to mention that since Indian occupation of uh, starting from 1947, till to date, any Indian soldier, any Indian army military officer has not been trialed for the crimes against humanity or war crimes in India. And as we all know that uh, there's that uh, illegally Indian occupied Kashmir is a conflict according to UNO as well, and it is a territory. Therefore, international humanitarian law is also applicable uh, there. And when we see that record, because when we see um, that how India tries to maintain its occupation, it is due, use of excessive torture use of excessive violence. And this is what exactly what has been repeated a few days back in Rajoli, uh, in illegally in, in, in occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Unfortunately, no international voice uh, was raised uh, against this heinous crime, and which is definitely uh, a war crime, which, which is definitely a severe, um, uh, intense violation of human rights, which is the violation of the rights of prisoners and which is against any law existing in this world. So, but there was not a single voice and only, I, I can be wrong, but only Al Jazeera reported uh, one news and I've seen one uh, few news on BBC and that's it. But there is no organizational collective voice against such heinous uh, crime. And this is the sad part of the story and this is what Give uh, give strength and motivation into Indian government to carry on with all those uh, tactics to subjugate uh, Kashmiri Muslims. And and I would like to add that the only way or only tool uh, this this to to inculcate here with the use of such 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 violence to demonstrate that no law applies of Indian on Indian occupational forces occupied forces. And they are not abide by any law to respect Kashmiri, uh, indigenous Kashmiri population. This perception Indian government creates to just only to maintain and strengthen its occupation of this uh, of Jammu and Kashmir. And this is the sad part. 
but definitely we all know that when ball hits the ground it has to come up and and what and and if those uh, those tactics of use of excessive uh, violence and torture was uh, would be that fruitful then kashmiri kashmiri in indigenous resistance movement would not be there kashmiri people still and if india india thinks that through use of such excessive torture it has inculcated fear in the hearts of kashmiri indigenous kashmiri population and kashmiri population is sided by india then it is all the more reason that modi government should conduct a plebiscite under uno in the indian occupied jammu and kashmir and see that if those tactics of hatred violence torture and fear are that useful to maintain its illegal occupation so uh right uh, dr khan your point you have made some very important and pertinent points so, so uh, th there are uh, certain media reports that suggest that indian army has launched an investigation into this particular incident what are your expectations is it going to be an honest investigation or is it going to be boshed up investigation or is it going to be similar on the lines of the biased verdict as far as the indian apex court recently is concerned uh, its verdict regarding the revocation of article 370 do you expect anything out of this investigation if it happens mean investigation if as we know the 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 the, the laws of south asia if those, those those kids i would call them kids or youth which were really youth was picked by indian military was killed by indian military and their families believe that indian military officials are responsible responsible for that then at first place an fir should be launched by those families who is indian military to investigate that if those people are those indian uh, officials are uh, responsible or not and then start the judicial and uh, or court proceeding this is incorrect first of all an fir should be launched against culprits and and the way indian military is dealing with this it is same hush hush it is same way to just to brush this crime under the carpet take some time so that the sentiments of people fade away and then indian military like what they are doing for last 75 years they would get, they would do this crime they have done this crime and they would get away with that and this is what happened this is what happened during the chhatri singh pura incident when indian military officials under the guise of uh, freedom fighters killed uh, more than 40 indigenous kashmiri sikhs it, it it is it is the same when the first uh, massacre uh, different genocide took place by in illegal in, in indian occupied jammu and kashmir no one single investigation uh, was completed or we haven't seen any single military officer or soldier being tried for his crime so this investigation we don't believe it and if india or indian government is so that much serious about those innocent loss of those innocent lives then the such investigation should take place under international law by an international organization such as un human rights commission amnesty international or other international uh, organizations for such uh, so th then th there would be a slight possibility that indian officials would not uh, influence those that investigation and the key investigations would still take place otherwise in the most uh, in seized and uh, each region of south asia where there is no uh, no uh, no right to information available for indigenous kashmiri population how anyone can trust that closed door investigation and especially when this investigation is being um, conducted by the same institution which has committed this crime which has took those innocent lives of kashmiri youth so how that same institution can conduct any investigation against their own people so an independent international organization should should uh, should um, 
conduct that uh, those investigations. Otherwise, those are only Dignan our investigation. Uh, Dr. Khaja, your point is well taken. You don't expect anything substantial or concrete coming out of this investigation if it happens uh, by the same uh, people who have actually been involved in perpetrating this particular crime. One last question from you. When it comes to the treatment of women in particular, we see a uh, uh, high level of sensitivity when it comes to uh, the international community and major powers understanding of that particular treatment of the women rights. Now, these are the stats which I am going to share with you uh, that have been shared by uh, Kashmir Media Service. The women since 1989 till 30th of November 2023, 11,259 have been gang raped or molested and ever since the uh, revocation of article 370 since 5th of august 2019 uh, the number stands to be at 129 is this number not big enough to shake the conscience of uh, the human rights champions globally when it comes to the treatment of women uh, and their dignity this very rightly pointed out and we need a statistic that how much, how many uh, culprits involved in those crimes were trialed and, and given punishment by Indian judiciary. So I, I remember, I, I forget the name, but there was a girl child who was gang raped by four Hindus in India, in the Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir. And those Hindus, they, they played the Hindutva cause to justify the killing of an innocent. Kashmiri uh, girl, she was three, four years old, and and then they, 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 there were they, uh, demonstrations on the street by Hindu radicals to to not to punish those gang the the, 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 the culprits of gang rape. So this is how Indian society behaves when it comes to crime against women, even a girl ch against girl child. So in, in the Kashmiri women and those, those those statistics are not about the half widows. Those Kashmiri women whose family members have been misplaced by Indian uh, military and they have never been seen again. And those half widows they 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 they, they are suffering from social social trauma, psychological trauma, personal trauma, and no one talks about it. The, the, the plight of Kashmiri women who are victims and survivors of Kashmir conflict, that, that has been undocumented and until today. The, 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 the grief of Kashmiri women who lost their male members in, in conflict and in excessive violence launched by Indian military, carried out by Indian soldiers, that, that grief is not being documented and world doesn't know about it. I wish that some institution should conduct a research about the plight of Kashmiri women, the unsung, the unheard stories of, of those Kashmiri, of their survival and how they have been victims of a gang rape by Indian, by uh, Indian occupant forces, because we know that uh, since the war started, women are used as, as war trophies. They attack to undermine the dignity and prestige and self-respect of a community or a nation. And this is what exactly the Indian armed forces are doing in Kashmir in order to, 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 in order to break the honor, in order to break the, the resilience of Kashmiri community, indigenous Kashmiri population, Indian forces, they, they badly treated Kashmiri women. Women are are acute victim of the violence and this violence is not even even like physical including physical this is gang rape this is physical violence this is the violence of uh, of being treated as lesser being in a society this is the violence from revoking their right to education their right to access to medical to health facilities and and this and the list goes on and on but this is really unfortunate situation where international organization needs to stand up and such, such statistics, is the high numbers of the gang rape and uh, molestation victims over there in IIOJK when it comes to the dignity and the rights of women over there. And uh, we see that uh, kind of silence on the part of the international community when it comes to upholding those rights of women.
ڈاکٹر آسما شاکر خاجہ ایگزیکٹیو ڈائریکٹر ایس اینڈ اوو انٹرنیشنل سٹریجک سٹڈیز ایٹ اے جے کے تھینک یو ویری مچ فور بینگ ود اس آن دا شو ٹونائٹ ریلی اپریشیٹ دیٹ مسٹر رانا نا واٹس یور انڈرسٹینڈنگ واٹ شوڈ آئی ریلی بی ڈن وین اٹ کمس ٹو دا ڈگنیٹی آف ویمن دا کائنڈ آف از انٹ اٹ ہیوج نمبر دیٹ ایکچولی شوڈ بی سینڈنگ چل ڈاؤن دا اسپائن آف اینی بڈی اینی بڈی سین when it comes to the treatment dignity of women in I, I, I do agree. Well, first, we, you know, we need to understand this uh, method behind this kind of madness and violence, of course. There is a method uh, behind this kind of violence and, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the kind of you know, staggering number, statistics about the gang rape, uh, gang rape and you know, the violence and uh, the kind of other mistreatments and, uh, of course, you know, challenging the dignity of women as well. Of course, you know, they want to basically uh, you know, create a sense of uh, an environment of fear in Indi Indian occupied Kashmir. Why? Because they basically want to uh, affect the psychological, uh, uh, you know, uh, they want to affect the psychology of the Indian people, right? Uh, uh, especially the, the people living in Kashmir, right? And also they want to create a kind of deterrence. Uh, deterrence. Why? Because uh, so people, uh, you know, people uh, does not uh, act. Uh, uh, they basically want to stop the resistance movement. Or uh, well, I mean, you mean to say that rape as a deterrence? Uh, I mean, to deterrence. I mean, just to create, resistance? just to create, just to create a fear. I mean, in the hearts and the minds of the people, they're using as a method. Uh, why not? Yes, they're using uh, as a method. So if if this egregious, gut wrenching act is being used as a deterrence to uh, this freedom struggle or the resistance the over The right there. of independence of the Kashmiri yeah. people, yeah. I mean, uh, what does that actually should actually garner when it comes to the champions of human rights across the world? I mean, of course, you know, interpretation, as I mentioned uh, in the first half of my, you know, whatever I, uh, whatever I said, I mean, the interpretation and application of international law is different. I mean, if America violates uh, international, uh, you know, international law in Guatemala, in Perugoy, Uruguay, I mean, interpretation is different. If India violates the uh, human rights violation in Kashmir, so the interpretation and application is, of course, different. Uh, so, yes. So. This is Safraz Ahmed Rana, foreign policy expert. Thank you very much for taking time out for your views on news tonight. Really appreciate that. With that, we'll come to the end of today's show. Till the next one, take good care of yourselves.